Welcome to our online worship service here at Christ Alone in Mequon and Thienesville. Very glad to have you with us and gathered around the Word today as we see how followers of Christ trust in God to provide for them. God's blessings on your worship will begin with our opening hymn, God Loved the World So That He Gave. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Amen. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children, but we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, you have given exceedingly great and precious promises to those who trust in you. 
Grant us so firmly to believe in your Son, Jesus, that our faith may never be found wanting. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first scripture reading today comes from the book of 1 Kings, chapter 17. These words will serve as our sermon text today. Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishba in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years, except at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Leave here, turn eastward, and hide in the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook, and I have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. So he did what the Lord had told him. He went to the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan, and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Go at once to Zarephath, in the region of Sidon, and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar, so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, And bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, Don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said. But first... Make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me and then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, the jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. She went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry, in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. This is God's word. Our second reading today comes from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 8. We see in this section as Paul holds up the example of the Macedonian Christians who were generous even though they were experiencing great need in their lives. Their generosity flowed from their trust in the Lord, who always provides for his people. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord, and then by the will of God also to us. So we urged Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part, But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. This is God's word. We'll continue with our gospel acclamation. Alleluia! You will be enriched in every way, so that you can be generous on every occasion. 
Alleluia. Our gospel today is recorded in Mark chapter 12. We hear the account of this widow who had her trust fully in the Lord and demonstrated that by offering to the Lord all that she had. As he taught, Jesus said, Watch out for the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses, and for a show, make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put, and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. The Gospel of the Lord. We'll join together in our hymn of the day, Children of the Heavenly Father. Grace and peace to you from our Lord Jesus Christ, who knows our needs and well provides us. How far do you let the needle go down before you start looking for a gas station? One of my college roommates told me that his dad had kind of a strange fascination with seeing how far he could push it running on empty. He knew what the manufacturers said about how many miles you can go once the light comes on, but he also knew that it was only an estimate. If you eased on the gas rather than flooring it, if you coasted whenever you could rather than keeping steady on the gas, you could probably squeeze a few more miles out. Besides that, he would point out that as the gas tank got emptier, the whole car got lighter, which meant, of course, that your mileage would improve. He loved to push it, and he ran out of gas a lot. It was kind of a family joke, and as you can well imagine, a family frustration. 
The counterpart to this guy is the one who can't bear to watch the needle go below half before they start searching for a station. What about you? Are you comfortable running on empty? Or do you prefer to have the needle much closer to full? And what if we're talking about something more than our gas tank? What if we're talking about our health, our joy, our family and friends, or just the basic things of life that we need to survive? How do we respond when these things or others seem in short supply? The prophet Elijah understood what running on empty was all about. Here in 1 Kings 17, he kind of explodes onto the scene with very little introduction, but a very powerful message. God raised up this prophet and sent him to King Ahab in Israel to announce his judgment. Of all the kings who came before Ahab, he surpassed them in his wickedness. He married Jezebel, the daughter of the king of Sidon, and she brought with her the wicked idolatry of Baal and Asherah worship. And Ahab didn't just put up with it, he supported it. Between the two of them, they basically made Baal worship the official state religion in the northern kingdom of Israel. But no matter if he was rejected or ignored, God still reigned, and these false gods were absolutely impotent. And God was about to demonstrate that. He sent Elijah to announce to Ahab that there would not be any rain on the land, not even any dew, until God, through Elijah, said otherwise. So Elijah's ministry began with a bang. But God already had more in mind for his prophet. He would be center stage in a very public showdown between the Lord God of Israel and the false god Baal. He would have a successor to train and kings to anoint. God had big plans in mind for Elijah. But there would also be some very dark and difficult times, a bout of depression and discouragement when his ministry seemed to be pointless, questions about God's ability to accomplish anything in the hearts of his people. There would be plenty of highs and plenty of lows. And so right after God introduces Elijah to his people, he sends him on a little vacation, sort of, to train him and teach him, to prepare him for his future ministry. God said, leave here, turn eastward, and hide in the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan. Well, sounds kind of nice, right? A secluded spot by a stream to do a little soul searching. When we lived in Montana, I had a spot on the Gallatin River near Bozeman where I like to go and fish. Most days I wouldn't see anyone at all, just clear water and hopefully a few trout. It was a great place to think, give thanks, reflect, and recharge. And it was close enough that I could be home for dinner and sleep in my own bed that night. But Elijah's vacation spot was a little different, and he had no idea how long he'd be there. He was a refugee, hiding for his life from the king and his murderous wife. He was tucked away in a rocky ravine. The only supplies he had was what he carried on his person. His food would be brought to him by ravens. His water supply came from the stream that would become thinner by the day as the drought continued. Elijah was running on empty, separated from his home and family and friends, wondering how long the food and water would last, and knowing that there was a bounty on his head for doing the very thing that God told him to do. But remember, God is training him, teaching him, and preparing him. So what did Elijah learn? Well, he learned to wait for the twice-a-day visits by the ravens. As the stream slowed to a trickle, how long would it take him to quench his thirst or to gather an extra cup of water? He also learned to trust that God would continue to command the birds to come, that the stream would continue to supply enough water for him, he learned, of course, of God's incredible power to sustain him, even if it took ravens and even in the midst of a severe drought. 
He must have learned to shut his eyes to the circumstances that surrounded him and focus his heart on the God who promises, I will never leave you or forsake you. He learned to trust his God. And when you're running on empty, no matter what the circumstances are, there is no more important lesson. And this was a lesson that he could teach to others. And God quickly gave Elijah that opportunity. Elijah's vacation was going to continue, but now in a new place. Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. Well, if Elijah thought things were scarce in the Kareth Ravine, this new spot must have seemed even more empty. To Zarephath in Sidon? That's Jezebel's home turf. A widow will supply my needs, but the drought is affecting that land also. And how often don't we hear about God's desire for us to support the widows who lack means, but not the other way around? And by the way, who is she? How will I recognize her? These thoughts might all occur to us, but Elijah didn't give voice to any of them. Instead, we're simply told this. He went. The time along the Kareth Ravine had made Elijah a bit more comfortable running on empty. And now God would work this same trust in the heart of this foreign widow. I love the opening conversation between Elijah and this woman. He won't budge in his confidence that God will provide. And after just a little debate, she is miraculously moved by that confidence. Her willingness to go along with Elijah's instructions must have increased his trust in God's promises and power even more. Here was a destitute widow planning the final meal for her and her son in the midst of a severe drought. Yet she did what the prophet of the Lord asked of her. And she wasn't even an Israelite. She believed God's promise through Elijah that her jug and jar would not run out until God sent rain on the land. And each morning as she prepared a meal for herself and her son and her new house guest, God confirmed his promise. So like Elijah, she also was growing a bit more comfortable running on empty. But here's the question to think about. Were they really running on empty? Remember that man I told you about at the beginning who loved to push the limit with his fuel supply? Well, what if I also told you that he always kept a five-gallon jug of gas in the trunk of his car just in case he ran out? That would change things, right? Well, he didn't, by the way, so he often had to walk or phone family members to come get him. But here's what I'm getting at. Since Elijah and this widow had the Lord God of Israel with them, were they ever really running on empty? If the God who can stop and start the rain, the one who can command ravens to bring bread and meat, the one who can keep the jug and jar of a widow adequately supplied for three people day after day in the midst of a severe drought and famine, if that God is with you, are you ever really running on empty? Elijah and the widow learned the answer to that question. They would have to relearn it again in the future. But they understood that the Lord is the God who provides. Have we learned that lesson? How do we react when things in our life seem to dry up? When friends move on? When finances are sparse? When you have trouble finding joy in life? When there is no good news from the doctor? Do we let pessimism or apathy sink in and take root? Do we kick ourselves into high gear, thinking that only we can solve this problem? Do we quietly accuse God of being unconcerned with our circumstances? Do we feel like we're running on empty and there is no extra tank in the trunk? And why do we do this? It's that matter of trust, right? 
we don't see things going the way we think they should in our lives, even though we're doing everything God wants us to. And so we figure, why bother? God's not keeping up his end of the deal. Or we don't stop and consider the fact that God has provided for our needs for years and years, whether as an individual, a family, or a congregation, and that he has promised to always do so. Instead, we just see a small number in our checking balance or a large deficit in our annual budget, and we get scared and worried. It's that matter of trust. But this is the God who commands widows and ravens to provide for his people. This is the God who rained down bread from heaven and brought water out of a rock. This is the God who heals the sick and raises the dead. This is the God who laid the foundations of the universe and still holds it all together perfectly. And this is our God, the one who loved us before the beginning of time, the one who gave his only son in our place, the one who forgives us fully and freely for all of our doubt and worry, the one who calls us his own children, and promises to be with us always. So why should we ever get scared? Why should we ever be worried? If this God is with us and loves us dearly and even gave his own son in our place, and he is, and he does, and he did, then there is never a time when we are running on empty. Sure, the funds may be low, so was the oil in the jar and the water level in the stream. And sure, the friends may leave and the relationships that were once dear may come to an end. Elijah knew that as he sat alone in the ravine. The widow understood that when she said goodbye to her husband. Sure, our health may fail, our Christian life may be a struggle, and our battles with Satan and temptation may be trying, persistent, and exhausting. There certainly will be times when everything we see makes it feel like we're running on empty. But close your eyes, like Elijah might have, as he listened to the quiet trickle of the stream and the soft landing of the ravens and knew that God was caring for him. Close your eyes like the widow might have, as she felt the flour in the bottom of the jar, the small weight of oil in the jug, and knew that God was caring for her. When it seems like you're running on empty, no matter what the circumstances may be, close your eyes and listen again to some of God's promises. God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? God loves us, and he is with us, and he will take care of us, always. For God's children, there is no such thing as running on empty. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We will continue by confessing our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We'll join in the prayer of the church, remembering today our nation and also its veterans. Please join your hearts with mine. 
Almighty God, we acknowledge with thanks that all we have and enjoy is a gift from your gracious hand. We come before you today in heartfelt appreciation for our nation and its people. We thank you for enabling us to worship you in freedom and to serve you without fear. Lord and ruler of nations, you tell us not to trust in princes, but to put our faith in you. By your powerful word, strengthen our resolve to trust you more and more. At the completion of this election cycle, we thank you for the service of those who will soon be leaving office, and we praise you for the blessings you will provide through those continuing in office and those newly elected. Let your blessing rest on our president and vice president-elect and on all who hold public office. Grant them the wisdom to carry out their responsibilities with integrity and honor. Surround them with those who give honest and good counsel and guard them from every danger of body or soul. Teach us to honor them as your representatives, guide them with your wisdom, and graciously use them as your instruments to foster an atmosphere where your church can do its work in peace. As we look ahead to Veterans Day, let us never forget those who have devoted themselves to our protection through military service. Make us grateful for their willingness to leave their families and sacrifice their lives out of love for our country. Help us honor their service by faithfully fulfilling our own vocations as citizens so that their sacrifices are not rendered useless. We ask that you continue to protect those who serve in the armed forces and those who maintain peace and safety in our communities. Keep our financial institutions secure and our economy strong. Bless our fields that they may produce abundant harvests. Guard us from calamities of nature and accident and spare our land from the ravages of disease and epidemic. Teach us not to worry but to cast all our cares on you. Strengthen the homes of our nation. By your Spirit, lead husbands and wives to love each other, parents to nurture their children, young adults to assume responsibility, and children to show respect. Lead the citizens of our land to honor the useful foundations of society. Lord Jesus, care for those who are sick or have been injured. Calm those who are disappointed and depressed. Provide guidance to those who care for people in trouble or in need. Lead us to provide help when we can and to pray at all times. To you, O Lord, we bring our thanks and our requests. Hear our prayers for Jesus' sake. Amen. And we join in the prayer our Savior taught. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We'll join in our closing hymn, May the Peace of God.
Thank you so much for joining us for worship today. I pray hearing God's word was a blessing to you. Thank you also for your continued support of our ministry. Please join us again soon, and God's blessings on your week ahead.